Good morning, everyone. We're just going to give folks a few seconds to join. And then we'll get started here in a minute. Right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for today's webinar on the connections between water quality and health. My name is Alana Clark Kirk, and I am the Director of Communications at the Health Policy Institute of Ohio. Our mission is to advance evidence informed policies that improve health, achieve equity, and lead to sustainable healthcare spending in Ohio. We have lots of organizations to thank for their contributions in supporting our work. First, I'd like to thank our core funders who support HPIO's mission with their steadfast investment in our work. Thank you to our 2024 Educational Event Series presenting sponsor, the Ohio Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health Prevention and Promotion. Our 2024 educational event series is also gener generously supported by our gold and brown sponsors. All are listed here. The connections between water quality and health project was made possible through the generous support of the SD Ministry Foundation. We want to encourage you to put questions in the chat or Q&A box anytime during today's presentation, and we will answer questions as time allows. My colleague, Tony Oberly, will be monitoring the chat and responding to your questions there as well. We will have a few poll questions at the end, so please stick around to answer those. Evaluation is very important to us. I also want to thank Jasmine Barfield, who is holding it down with the Zoom controls, and she will put that poll up for us later. The slides and resources from today's webinar will be available to download on the event page of our website. And I actually hope that all of you were able to join us for the release of HPIO's 2024 Health Value Dashboard a few weeks ago. The dashboard includes over 100 metrics, a select few look at Ohio's performance on our physical environment. This brief is part of HPIO's work elevating the connection between health and the physical environment, not only in the dashboard, but also in a fact sheet that we released on outdoor air pollution early last year. Now I want to introduce my colleague, Jacob Santiago. Jacob is our policy and evaluation specialist. Today, he will be walking us through key findings from the brief on water quality. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> um, I feel like I learned so much from reading this brief, and I'm actually really excited to hear more from you today. So why don't we get started? Yeah, thank you so much, Alana. I know that myself and the team at HPO who worked on this brief certainly learned a lot when we were drafting it. Um, so we're excited to share that information with you all today. So thank you again for joining us. As Alana said, my name is Jacob Santiago, Policy and Evaluation Specialist at HPIO. To level set, I want to start us here with this pie graph that describes the modifiable factors that influence our health. When we think about health, we might think about access to clinical care and quality of healthcare services. And those two things make up 20% of that modifiable of those modifiable factors. A lot of people will also think about our health behaviors, how we eat, move, and treat our bodies. That represents 30% of the pie. And while those are certainly important pieces of the puzzle, on the left, in dark blue, we know that research finds that 50% of the influence comes from our social, economic, and physical environments. These are the conditions of our communities, our housing, transportation, and employment opportunities, as well as the air we breathe and the water we drink. All of these factors are underlain by the drivers of inequity, such as racism and other forms of discrimination, violence, trauma, and toxic stress. 
In order to improve health, we need to pay attention to all of these factors and the underlying drivers, paying particular attention to the communities we live in and the policies, systems, and structures that give people a fair chance at a healthy life. Here are the three key findings from the brief, and we'll look at each of them in more detail throughout our half hour together. Give you all a second to look through them. And our first key finding is that improving water quality will lead to improved outcomes. To better understand the impact water quality can have on health, we broke the brief into sections that align with the general focus areas of H2 Ohio, a state level partnership between four state agencies and local partners. I'll talk more about H2 Ohio in a bit. Those focus areas can be broken down into runoff, including agricultural and stormwater runoff and harmful algal blooms, infrastructure, including lead pipes, and industrial contaminants, including heavy metals, PFAS, and other types of contaminants. We'll explore each of these, starting with runoff and harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms are blooms of algae that carpet the water's surface, blocking sunlight and harming animals, humans, and underwater plants. These blooms release toxins that are dangerous to human health, leading to a range of negative outcomes, including liver cancer and kidney disorders. Harmful algal blooms develop from an overabundance of nutrients in water, such as nitrogen and phosphorus that the algae feeds on. On the slide now is a pathway demonstrating how algal blooms come to exist. So starting on the left and working our way right, conventional agricultural practices like overgrazing and the overuse of fertilizers, among other practices, produce high levels of nutrients that are carried into waterways by precipitation. These high levels of nutrients in water is called nutrient pollution. And this pollution leads to the development of harmful algal blooms. In addition to the health impacts, these blooms can negatively affect businesses, property values, and recreation, including fishing and swimming. The Ohio Departments of Health and Natural Resources and the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency are tasked with monitoring harmful algal blooms and setting thresholds which protect human health from the toxins. When bloom samples pass thresholds set by the state, an advisory is posted at the beach where the sample was taken. In 2023, 1,204 advisories were posted, the third highest year of the past eight. Exposure to agricultural runoff and harmful algal blooms is not equal across the state. People living in rural areas and communities and along the Lake Erie coast are more likely to be exposed to nutrient pollution and its negative impact. Moving on to our next bucket of infrastructure. Ohio has a large network of water service lines, also called water distribution systems, that are made up of 4,800 public water systems, delivering billions of gallons of clean drinking water across the state. However, as these systems age, they are more vulnerable to leaks, improper connections, and corrosion, among other types of damage. For example, the Ohio EPA reported that 31% of all household sewage systems in Ohio are experiencing some degree of failure discharging untreated sewage into waterways. And when contaminants in public water systems exceed levels set by the federal EPA, a drinking water advisory is issued. In 2022, 12 public water systems across seven counties received a violation. And while that seems low, it's important to note that one, 
to maintain a low number of drinking water violations, we must continue to invest in our water infrastructure to prevent future wear and tear that could increase violations. And two, this data does not include private water systems like a private well. Those are only required to be tested upon installation, meaning future contamination could be missed until a problem arises. Speaking of private water infrastructure, despite the large water distribution system serving Ohio, over 120,000 homes across the state lack complete plumbing facilities in their home as of 2021. This means they don't have hot and cold running water and or they don't have a shower or bathtub in the home. And the problem is worst in Appalachia, where 35,495 homes, 4% of all homes in the region, lack complete plumbing facilities. When talking about infrastructure, it's also important to highlight lead service lines. While lead lines were banned in the 1986 Federal Safe Water Drinking Act, homes across the state and water distribution systems across the state had water service lines that contained lead installed before the passage of that bill. Lead lines, like all infrastructure, will wear down over time causing the lead that makes up these pipes to leach into the water, harming residents. Fetuses, infants, and children under the age of six are the most vulnerable to lead poisoning, but lead can affect people of any age and can cause harm long after exposure. For example, in fetuses, infants, and children under six, lead exposure can delay development and in people over the age of six, lead exposure can cause cardiovascular problems. The challenge with lead lines lies in finding and replacing them. However, Ohio does not have a comprehensive inventory or map of lead lines across the state. Still, a recent estimation from the federal EPA found that Ohio had at least 369,000 lead lines, but could have as many as 745,000. Ohio, Ohio, however, has made progress in funding lead line identification and removal. H2 Ohio alone has distributed funds around the state to inventory, map, and replace lead service lines. Per capita, H2 Ohio has distributed the most funds to Appalachian counties and the least to suburban counties. However, in terms of total dollars awarded, metropolitan counties have received the most funding, but this may not match the need for funding per capita. A comprehensive map would be beneficial for determining need for this funding across the state. I do want to point out that the funding demonstrated in this graphic does not include funding for lead lines from the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed by the federal government in 2021. That funding flows through the state revolving loan fund rather than H2 Ohio. We know that the impact of Ohio's water infrastructure challenges is not universally or equally experienced. The groups listed on the screen are all more likely to live in communities with older, more at-risk infrastructure, including lead service lines. Historical and ongoing discriminatory policies and practices have shaped our communities, driving these disparities. And when it comes to pregnant mothers, infants, and children, they experience the impact um, of these water infrastructure challenges more because they consume more water per pound of body weight than other Ohioans. In our last bucket, industrial manufacturing and other processes affect water quality. Heavy metals like arsenic and lead, pharmaceuticals, and the production and use of PFAS, also called forever chemicals, can all pollute our waterways, 
harming nature, our health, and our economic well-being. For example, this is Sunday Creek down in Millfield, Ohio in Athens County. Acid mine drainage from the True Town discharge dumps over 2 million pounds of iron oxide into Sunday Creek each year, negatively affecting the habitat for seven miles. Pollution from mine drainage can happen long after a mine has been abandoned, negatively affecting water sources in a community, including aquatic life and recreation for decades. Communities like those near Sunday Creek are the ones most at risk for experiencing industrial pollution. These communities are often in Appalachian counties or are communities with low income or communities of color. Industrial workers are also at an increased risk of exposure to industrial pollution. And again, pregnant and lactating mothers, infants, and children experience this impact more because of how much water they consume per pound of body weight. I also want to elevate the role that climate change will play in affecting our water quality, including increased exposure to pollutants. Climate change is expected to increase the frequency of severe precipitation events, like the ones that have happened um, and pass through Ohio this month and last month. Heavy precipitation harms crops and overwhelms our infrastructure and natural water sources. This image is from a park in downtown Gahanna, a suburb of Columbus where I live, after the storm at the beginning of the month. The river going through that park severely flooded, blocking access to the park and surrounding recreational areas. And with that same storm system, several towns throughout central Ohio experienced flooding, some even prompting voluntary evacuations. Our next key finding from the brief is that there is a strong policy foundation on which Ohio policymakers can build. Policymakers in the General Assembly, at state agencies, and in local governments have all made decisions that have helped or hindered efforts to improve Ohio's water quality. Our first example is H2 Ohio, which is a comprehensive water quality initiative working to strategically address Ohio's water quality challenges, including water pollution and infrastructure and land conservation. Its state agency partners include the Ohio Departments of Natural Resources and Agriculture, the Ohio EPA, and the Lake Erie Commission. H2 Ohio provides grants across the state to address issues of water quality. On the slide now is a map of the number of projects funded by H2 Ohio in each region of the state and how much each region has received in funding. Northwest Ohio stands out here receiving over $140 million between 2021 and 2023, emphasizing the state's focus on agricultural runoff and improving water quality in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. House Bill 175 from the last General Assembly is an example of policy that has mixed views on its environmental and water quality impact. The bill removed state level regulations on ephemeral streams to match federal regulations under the Clean Water Act of 1972. Ephemeral streams are those produced by rainfall and are only present during wet weather or for part of the year. Proponents of the legislation said that the bill balanced regulatory burden on developers with water quality protections and opponents of the bill said that it harmed water quality because ephemeral streams are an important part of the water ecosystem and can carry pollution into larger bodies of water like lakes and rivers. Federal regulations for ephemeral streams have been in flux since the passage of the 1972 Clean Water Act. The act made it illegal to drain fill in or pollute waters of the United States without a permit, but did not define what those waters were. Ephemeral streams have lived in a regulatory gray area since, 
with the Obama and Biden administrations, including them as waters of the United States and the Trump administration excluding them. However, in May 2023, Supreme Court ruled that ephemeral streams and other non-permanent waterways are not included as waters of the United States under the Clean Water Act and thus not subject to federal regulations through the act. In terms of local policymaking, the city of Cleveland has dedicated a lot of policy attention over the past 70 years or so to water infrastructure. They banned lead lines, for example, in 1954, 32 years before the federal government. They also published a map of city-owned lead lines by census tract, shown on the slide now, and they have plans to develop an interactive map. And Rural Action, a community action agency in Southeast Ohio, has partnered with state and federal agencies and the Ohio University to clean up Sunday Creek. The partnership, called True Pigments, plans to remove the iron oxide from Sunday Creek and develop pigments for paints, dyes, and construction. The partnership's goal is to restore the creek and create new economic opportunity in the area. One thing I really want to call out is the role policymaking has played in improving our environment. A recent study from the Ohio EPA found that in the 1980s, only 18% of Ohio rivers met water quality standards. But by the beginning of this decade, almost 90% were meeting standards. And the biggest contribution to this improvement were efforts to improve sewage collection and treatment and soil conservation. So what next? There are things Ohio policymakers at all levels can do to continue the momentum to improve. I will list a few options along with examples of implementation, but there are more policy options listed in the brief. So our first example, state and local policymakers can leverage state and federal dollars to map inventory and replace lead lines across the state using the maps to strategically invest in the communities with the most lead lines. In addition to Cleveland, Grand Rapids, Michigan has an interactive lead line map that details which lines need to be replaced, which ones are up to code, and the ones that are unknown. The Department of transportation can work with municipal and county governments to explore the use of permeable pavement to reduce stormwater runoff. The Pennsylvania Department of Transportation has used permeable pavement in walking and bike paths and parking lots. And lastly, local governments can implement multi-component groundwater management plans to reduce groundwater pollution and improve water quality. They can look to and align with Ohio's surface and groundwater monitoring strategy as a part of their plans. We'll take a pause for any questions. Thank you, Jacob. Tony, do we have any questions in the chat? No, I'm not seeing any questions. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Of course. All right. If you want to advance the next couple of slides for me. Yeah. Um, hope is that this work is helpful to you in your effort to influence policy and improve health and well-being in our state. There are many ways that you can influence policy, both as a private citizen and as a representative of your organization, such as providing data or analysis to a policymaker, giving legislative testimony or inviting a policymaker to visit your organization or a meeting that you host? I wanna quickly call out here. Um, we know that this type of work doesn't happen in a bubble and that's that 
um, by working uh, all of us together that we make Ohio a model of health, well-being, and economic vitality. And I want to give um, a shout out to uh, our water quality advisory group here at HPIO. I know that we could not have done this work without their time, energy, and expertise. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah. All true, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, with that in mind, we have some poll questions for you about how you plan to use the information presented on today's webinar, as well as a few brief evaluation questions. Um, so please scroll, or I'm going to have Jasmine put those up. There we go. Um, there are six questions here, so please scroll to make sure you see them all. And we'll give you all some time to answer those. Don't be shy. I haven't seen too many people <laughs> <laughs> click the button just that, but go for it. Um, this is also another opportunity to comment in the chat with any feedback you have on today's mm -hmm. event. You can also submit feedback in the survey that will show up um, in your browser after the webinar ends here in a few minutes. So just give everybody a few, a few more minutes to put some, to answer the, the, cold, the poll questions. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. I think we can move on yeah all right if you have questions that were not answered today um after listening to jacob's presentation or you want to learn more about this brief you can reach out to jacob and his contact info is on the screen as well as our website um go forward for me jacob all the materials for today's webinar, including the publication and the slides will be available at hpio.net on the events tab. Please stay connected with our work by signing up for our mailing list and following us on LinkedIn. We have a QR code on the left side of your screen to make it easier for you to find our account on LinkedIn. Thank you again for attending our webinar and have a great rest of your week. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for joining us.